Greetings, everybody. Glad you're all here. And uh, we have two guests, not guests, two new members. Uh, one new member and a friend. So anyway, Manny Fresh and Kat, welcome. First time here. Glad to have you. We did just buy our banner. We have it hanging up on the wall there. You can take, take a look. That's where we use some of the money. I don't have any other further business except to introduce Rachel. Thank you very much, Rachel. Now, is your name spelled with an apostrophe? Yes. It is, okay. But on your Depending email, on my it's mood. not. Unless I didn't do it. I was dodging the actual O'Leary's for a while there, so I left it out. But, you know, everything's all right. Now. All right. Well, thank you very much for coming. We appreciate it my greatly. My pleasure. And let me get out of the way. It's all yours. All right. Well, today I'm going to be talking about nano aquaria and sort of the, some of the unique obstacles of maintaining not just small tanks, but small species, because there's a lot of them. <laughs> These are just some examples that people have sent me over the years of their tanks, or in the case of this one that I've stolen um, for no particular reason, just to show some, some ideas of the different setups. There's, there's so many out on the market now that you know, I haven't even seen. You know, I don't actually, um, I only have a few small tanks in my fish room. I prefer big tanks with little fish. So a lot of the kits or specific uh, brands that are being sold, I'm, I'm not particularly familiar with. So if you ask me a question about a 60P, I'm gonna tell you what are the dimensions, tell me more about it, just to get that out of the way. So be prepared. So some of the unique challenges of small tanks, which is, is what I started with, is that you know, with a little tiny tank, obviously you get huge fluctuations because there's less volume. And where that can become problematic is when you're keeping something like shrimp that are intolerant to those fluctuations. Or when you're trying to, you know, do a small water change and it turns into a big water change. Or if you get, you know, lights on a timer that go off at a certain time and you're not using a heater, you can get a lot of big variables pretty quickly in a tiny tank. Maintenance can be a real chore, you know, as I mentioned, you know, trying to do a water change and siphon all your substrate without emptying the tank completely can, can be a bit of an issue. Uh, filtration, finding something that looks good in a small tank, hiding your equipment can be an issue. And then feeding little critters can be really challenging, especially because a lot of them are specialized grazers or just the fact that their physicality is so small. A lot of the commercially prepared foods don't always work out very well. Um, and then I think the biggest problem with the majority of fish keepers in general, but especially in small tanks, is overfeeding and then causing those big fluctuations in parameter. So some of the filters that I use, um, or that I prefer, up until recently, my pointer doesn't really work on the screen, so I'll use my hand. Um, I've been using the majority of these block filters, and they're made by Swiss Tropicals out of Perret foam. Um, they have these lift tubes that are drilled all the way around inside the foam, so you get a really nice, dense, fine bubble output. Maybe not so great if you're running CO2, but really awesome as far as filtration goes. At one point, I had done a comparative study between the ATI, which are pre the best sponge filters before these came out, and the bubble output was markedly different. But not only that, being a lazy fish keeper, I would have to clean the ATIs, you know, every six weeks. Um, <laughs> but I can take these guys, you know, once or twice a year, and what I do is I have multiple in each of my tanks because they're larger. I'll take them out, I'll replace them with a, one of the ones in there out, replace it with a clean one, and then I just run them through my dishwasher on hot. Huh. And I don't even have to do anything. It's great. I pack them up in a box when they're done, and then six months later when I need to clean filters again, that's what I do. Uh, another thing that I really like are these, these old school sort of corner filters that have been around forever. I'm really not sure why more people don't still use them. They're like a buck. You can shove them full of whatever you want. Um, they're, they're especially invaluable if you need to use a chemical media to reduce meds or tannins or you know whatever, which is something that you can't do with your sponge filters. So I think they're really invaluable. But recently what I've been converting to is these, and this is another Porette foam um, product. And what I really, really like about these 
is uh, once this is full of water, these braces pretty much disappear. And you set this up in your, in your corner. You can hide your heater back there. You can hide you know, different tubes back there. So when you're setting up a scape or you know, if, if you're like me and you just don't want to hit the filter with a net when you're netting in the tank every day, these are really, really nice. And the best part is, is Stefan swears that you almost never have to clean them. And again, lazy fish keeper. To me, that sounds like heaven. You know, even if I have to do it once a year, just pull that foam out and rinse it. That sounds perfect. And what I do with a lot of these types of things is I'll just um, super glue moss or uh, even small Anubias or Java ferns right onto it, and their roots will infiltrate into the, the thing, and you make a living wall that you can easily remove to trim. Um, in previous years, I'd done like the latch hook mesh and done the sandwich and chopped up all the moss and grown it that way. And I had a lot of issues with it growing evenly and then being able to maintain it nicely. And these are really nice and easy to make sort of a living wall on. So that's just one of the reasons I like them. And this is actually what I'm, what I'm getting ready to do in my 150 gallon as well. Of course, that one will be substantially larger than one I would put in a teeny tiny tank. But they're neat. And basically, um, you, can use, you can just use an uh, air pump and you run it. There's a hole at the bottom of the tube down here that you plug it into and it sucks the water through this large filter media and then this is your discharge. I would imagine it'd be pretty easy to figure out a way to use a canister and if you're running like inline CO2 or whatever to do it that way as well and then you have the majority of your equipment out of the tank allowing for more room for your hardscape and plants. Something, something I think that uh, Stefan should be capitalizing more on is advertising in that way. And who's Stefan? Stefan Tanner is the owner of Swiss Tropicals. He's out in uh, Rochester, Minnesota. Okay. He's, accept he's got a website, swisstropicals.com. <clears throat> if you email him with, um, if you're, if you're going to try and set one of these up, you want to measure inside your tank um, from bottom to top, just underneath the trim, and he will send you custom made and cut glass braces as well as advise you there's many different colors and porosities of this foam i tend to go with one that's sort of an oranger color i believe it's a 20 ppi because it's coarser and i'm lazy and i don't want to clean it but he has them in all colors and all different porosities and thicknesses i think from a, probably one inch up to five inch you know and also you can buy sheets of foam from him if you wanted to just make your own like when I do stuff like this, I tend to buy sheets of the foam, you know, eight foot sheets, because I'm doing 100 plus tanks. When I bought the block filters, these guys, I bought 300. And then, you know, that way I can be lazy and put in as many as I want and have some clean to switch them out rather than having to, to clean them as I go. I mean, I worry about a lot of things in my fish room, cross contamination, you know, if things are in quarantine, I don't want to potentially you know, mix anything, <clears throat> transferring species. So that's why I tend to also, it's not just because I'm lazy. It's also so that I make sure that I don't, you know, mix anything from tank to tank. Yes. Do you have a larger size tank that that would fit in? The corner filter? The filter, yeah. Uh, well, I'm getting ready to put it in the 150. Okay. You know, I, I would imagine, you know, he's got a ratio. And if you go to his website, he's got all the theory. This is basically an advancement on the matten filter. And the matten filter was the sheet of foam across the entire back of the tank or against the entire side of the tank where you would have like a space like this and you would run your air and the lift tubes there. This is sort of an improvement um, in that it doesn't take up as much space. So if you go to his, his site, he has all the theory behind it. He's got all this, I mean, he's a, a geneticist. So there's a lot of science available that he'd be happy to give you. Um, I skim a lot of that. <laughs> I go for results, you know, and I, I've seen results <clears throat> with this particular brand of foam that he's the only one in the U.S. That so in a 150, you're going to just use an air, air lift? No, what I did is I have an FX5, uh, Fluval FX5, that I've um, plumbed with one-inch PVC. So one, it's in the middle behind the tank, and so this way it's going to go, my intake is going to come up over the top and go down, and mm -hmm. it'll be drilled with, you know, quarter-size holes the whole way down for suction, 
and then I ran one inch um, PVC to the other end and I made a spray bar of one inch PVC that I drilled and it's, it's going to be a modified river manifold so the current's going to be exceptionally strong. Um, but this is going to provide, this is typically with a modified river manifold system, you take the PVC down to the bottom and then you have tubes coming up that you put pre-filters on, which means um, I'm doing a lot of rock work. I can't, that means I'm going to have to cut around that for my egg crate. That means in order for me to be able to maintain those pre-filters, I'm going to have to not use hardscape there. So my thought with doing this was I'll just have to cut this little awkward angle in the egg crate there, but I'll be able to utilize the entire six or seven foot length of this tank for my rock and um, driftwood scape with just, and not have to worry very much about cleaning this like right. I would the pre-filters. What are you gonna put inside your FX5? Uh, right now it has chopped up foam and um, ceramic rings. Okay. Cause it's, it's mainly, I'm just, particularly worried about biological filtration. Right. I did leave the top basket, the top central basket open for polishing pads should I need them at some point. Okay. Um, but this is gonna be for, you know, inch fish. So I'm not particularly worried about the poop load, right. you know? <laughs> yeah. I, I'm more concerned okay. about the turnover rate, oxygenation, and flow no for the species that I would not work with. Lecture. I'll see you. Uh, but I, I really, you know, if you're curious about these, I really encourage you to look into them. I think for my 150, it was about maybe 80 bucks shipped for the piece of foam and the braces. And he'll even sell you the silicone if you need it for like $4. Huh. I have a lot of silicone. My husband has tubes of it, so I didn't worry about that. And I didn't buy the lift tube because, again, I'm modifying a um, canister filter. So it wasn't necessary. Now, on his website, it was... Um there was a recommended flow. Yes. And since you're doing the river tank, it's going to be a lot more. Mine is going to be, uh, <coughs> but I'm only using this as the, as the suction. Right. So I'm not using this as the return, the corner okay. filter. Yes. So I don't think it'll be a problem because they're at opposite ends okay. of the short sides of the tank. You know, because it's a, a lateral across okay. the tank movement, not, um, not a more typical setup. How often are you going to clean your canister filter? Probably never until it stops. I love you. <laughs> because that's how I roll. I'm like, oh man, where's my flow? Why are my fish at the surface? Oh. <laughs> Got it. I think it's I've cleaned it. I mean, 2015? Oh, man, I put that in six years ago. Isn't that incredible? <laughs> Then you open up the media and it's like this gelatinous mud. You can't even remember what it was. Yeah, that's that's how you feel bad because you know you are killing off an entire new planet's worth. Of it, uh, that, that's you that's know? primordial ooze right there. Damn it's it. it's pretty gross. And sometimes I'll just flip it into the trash can and then start over. <laughs> so. Yeah, I think I think the filter on the twenty nine's going two years now. I I before wow. I got this 150, I had a 60 breeder set up where it is now, well, as well as many other tanks. And I had a canister on that. I didn't even remember I had a canister filter running on it. <laughs> I just assumed it was sponge filters like everything else. So that tells you how well I maintained that one. But that you know, 60 is in my living room now. That 60 breeder? Yeah. Are you, got, are you the one that took that? Yeah, that's, that's in awesome. my living room. That was a good tank. Anyway, so this is, this is, what I like, what I'm trying to transition to in my fish room. I think what'll actually end up happening is I'll hopefully get to put in a fish building and I'll just redo everything then um, <laughs> because it's, it's really daunting. I'm also wanting to upgrade all my lights to LED and that's equally as daunting. So as I mentioned, siphoning can be a pain in the butt and I have a bunch of cheap tricks that uh, I use to, to sort of make it easier in those little tanks. I'll actually use uh, like rigid airline tubing, just the length of it and hook it to regular airline tubing or even use one of the little step up valves to slightly larger siphoning and then I'll use that to suction the debris out um, rather than using your typical siphon. That way the, the draw is very slow, but it's also very gentle. So if you have shrimp in the tank, if you have fry in the tank, if you have delicate you know, root structure on plants that you don't really want to disrupt, you have a very gentle flow out. Now they, they can become occluded, so I tend to keep a little like bottle brush or pipe cleaner nearby um, if I get like a small piece of dirt or whatever in there. 
Other thing I'll do is I'll take, these are uh, Penguin pre-filters for power heads and they fit beautifully over some of the small size siphons, like for the nano tanks, you can just chuck that over there. I tend to drain, um, that probably sounded awesome. When I, did that. <laughs> I tend to drain, you know, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 tanks at a time, um, start my siphon and I put them into my drain ports. So by doing this, I can make sure that, again, I'm not gonna drain the tank too fast but also that I'm not sucking in my critters, which with little tiny guys, they're, they're not real bright. You know, they don't <laughs> seem to understand that, you know, the, the roller coaster ride through the siphon is not the best for their longevity. <laughs> uh, another thing I'll do is just take a net and rubber band that. It's real classy. And then the, what I've, what, I don't have a picture of it, I don't think, no. Um, but what I've actually started making recently is more PVC, and I'll buy whatever <laughs> diameter I want, depending on tank size. And then I put a T on it, and then I put um, screens, uh, like sort of for like a, a sink over the side with a two-way valve. So I can turn the valve on, start the suction, run it to my drain ports, and it's got the screened parts, so nothing can get sucked in. And then when I'm done, I can you could you could theoretically I don't I could run my water line back into it and refill the tank. Uh, I do that a different way. But those are really nice too because you can set them, like if you do only ever do 30% water changes, if you set your elbow so that it's at that level in the tank, you can't over drain your tank. So that's kind of nice. Um, I've, you know, I'm pretty notorious for flooding my fish room and also accidentally <laughs> emptying tanks completely by getting distracted for, by something shiny. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I do that a lot with mine too because when you do multiple tanks, so I start draining one and I go back to refill the other. And I have a, um, a suction cup on a clip like you would use for a heater or for a filter flow. And I put that on the end of the siphon and stick that into the glass. I use, and that way I can adjust whatever level and it's only going to drain for that part. Another, I can want another cheap thing too is the, the clips that hold clip lamps. You know, just like your normal clip lamps, if you take them off the dome, those that you can run the siphon tube through the little triangle hole into the tank and clip it to the trim, and you can set your height that way as well. And of course, that's if you're not particularly worried about siphoning up debris, if you're just changing water. Yeah, I don't use substrate in most of my tanks, so I'm generally concerned with siphoning out the debris that's visible. One of the big obstacles I mentioned was feeding these little guys. These are chili rasboras. You can see that giant gaping maw of death. It's, you know, half inch to three quarter inch fish. So what they're eating there is uh, baby cyclops. You can see, you know, uh, the majority of, I mean, you can crush flake and they'll eat that, but the majority of commercially produced pellets or, or even the, the flakes are just too big for them. So you have to take that into consideration. I feed a lot of live foods, Daphnia, microworms. Actually, I'm a bone thug microworm killer because I always forget about them. And then, you know, you get that smell of rotten death that you can't identify and you find your microworm culture shoved underneath the tank. But they're wonderful if you don't kill them. I use a lot more of, oh, I don't have them, of white worms, which are slightly larger than the microworms, but they don't stink and um, you don't have to change out the media of the culture nearly as much. You just use really moist potting soil. So those are very nice, um, very small. Daphnia is great. The adult Daphnia is a little bit large, but the, the baby Daphnia are great. So you start your culture, you keep the adults breeding, you, you know, use a coarse net, you can pull out the babies to feed. It's nice for prey-driven fish. Even small fish are prey-driven. And then I do use a lot of prepared foods in my fish room. Um, I use a lot of pellets. Mainly because when I feed pellets, you know, everybody does this, even the fish, and it's a really great way for me to sort of take an inventory of, of who's eating, who's not, how they look, you know, what they're doing, whatever. So I, I feed a lot of pellets. Uh, even tetras and stuff will go to the bottom of the pellets, you know, they're, they're, they're pretty easy. Uh, I, I tend to feed extreme pellets. Um, I like the quality of their food. And then I feed a lot of the gelatinized foods especially for my, my specialized grazers. You know, a lot of the gobies I work with, um, or a lot of the, the catfish I hoard, really <laughs> prefer an algae-based diet, and, and the gel foods that you mix with boiling water are excellent for that because you can use them with a lot of different delivery methods. I paint them onto, um, I have uh, 
big bins of driftwood sticks. So when I'm making my rapashi, I'll lay out all the sticks on the counter and I'll just pour the rapashi onto the sticks, wrap them up with some cling wrap and foil, throw them in the freezer and then pull them out to drop into the tanks with the grazers. That way they're grazing to eat, not trying to find some little spot. So you can also stand it up in the tank so that you can have them graze at all levels. You know, it's, it's easy to do and it works out really well. For my application as well, uh, medicating fish through ingestion is often much more efficient and affordable. You know, I, if I'm medicating, you know, a teeny tiny fish, but it's in a 75 gallon tank, that can get really expensive. But if you're putting it in the food, you dose for the volume of food, not for the volume of the tank, because it stays in the food. So it, it can be a much better way, much better delivery method uh, for medications or you know, just nutrition. This is, uh, these are the kind of fish I'm going to be doing in my 150. I think I have to talk about them more. These are, uh, that's Stiphodon percnopterygionis. This is Atropopurius. That's a uh, Unanalus cruciatus. This is females. It's a cherry barb. Um, Do they eat oh, algae? Spread. Pardon? Do they eat algae? Yes. They're, uh, they're in the wild. Most of these, these gobies are, are all off flux grazers, meaning they graze on the, the algae that grows in the current on fat, on, in fast moving water on rocks and also the micro crustaceans that get caught in that algae. So they're not only algae eaters, but algae is a very important part of their diet. What kind of uh, algae pellet food? I don't, because if you look at the ingredients in the majority of pelleted foods, there's not really any algae in it. Uh, generally, the first ingredient is, is fish or krill meal, and then it'll be, you know, some sort of yeast, and then it'll be peas, and then it'll be something else. And after you get past about the first five ingredients, the ratio of, of that ingredient to what the percentage of the food is is so small, it might as well not be considered a you know, Amazing. of any value. You make your own? No, I use the gel foods, <laughs> which I, I helped develop them with um, Alan Rapashi, and that's actually, I forgot the donations for you guys, so I'll ship them to you, but um, the first ingredient is, is algae, you oh, know. On the Rapashi? Yeah, well, with the Soylent Green, Soylent Green isn't, this is a Siamese algae eater for scale. Yeah. <laughs> um, it, with the Soylent Green and the Super Green, they're the algae-based. Um, there's various diets. So, some things to think about when you're setting up one of these little tanks, you know, is with you guys, it's, I would assume it's a little bit different than a lot of the people that I talk to who just want to keep cool stuff. I think probably most of you are, are doing something cool with your tank, you know, so you would probably already know about your source water, but a surprising amount of people don't know anything about water chemistry. And when you're choosing nano species specifically, the, the hardness of the water is really relevant because they're, they're more sensitive. And small tanks, again, those changes, you, you need to know what you're working with. You need to know if you're going to be able to maintain a stable parameter. So you need to Learn about your source water and then pick according to it, unless you're going to run an RO system and remineralize and keep things at a specific parameter. You know, think about what are your goals. You know, if you're going to set up one of these beautiful planted tanks, are you going to be using a substrate that is going to leach out hardness and provide that soft environment? Or are you going to be using rocks that are going to increase the hardness? Again, in a little tank, these fluctuations can be quite large, so you really have to take that into consideration. In, in a 200-gallon tank, you can put in a couple of rocks that have, you know, some carbonate release that'll, and you won't even see a blip on the radar. In a four-gallon tank, you put a piece of rock in there that will do that, and it's going to be all over the place every water change. Um, to what temperature you can maintain, I touched on that briefly, you know, lights are getting better and better and better and impacting temperature less and less, but in a small tank, again, especially if the lights are close, you know, I've got tanks in my basement where I'll get, you know, 14 degree discrepancy overnight to the morning, wow. just from the lights being off from the central timer going out, you know, and it's a basement. Um, and then you've got to pick, like, what is your focus? Obviously, for a lot of you guys, it's, it's your, your scape. But what do you want to achieve with that scape? How do you want 
the critters that you choose to behave? Do you want, um, you know, sort of a, a utilitarian approach where they're going to help you maintain your scope? Do you want to see flashy breeding behavior? Or do you want them to choose a particular open area of your tank to congregate to offset your scape? There's a lot of different things to consider when, you, when you're picking your critters. Com compatibility is just one of them, you know. Obviously, if you're super into shrimp, you probably shouldn't pick a predator to put with it. Just my advice. <laughs> These are just some pictures of some of the invertebrates. I believe I have more of this coming on that, that are my favorites. Um, the most common, or the one that's been around the longest, is the cherry shrimp. They were introduced to the hobby in 2003. So invertebrates in general are extremely young in comparison to, to the rest of the hobby. Uh, very easy to breed. You get a female, it's driving me nuts, a female, which is larger, and you can see her visible saddle, and a male, which is smaller and has sort of more of a, a concavity to the undercarriage. You can tell that from about a half an inch, sometimes even smaller, their gender. They make a sweet, sweet shrimp love, and then she will transfer the sperm packets, fertilize these visible eggs, and then carry them underneath her abdomen here in her pleopods where she turns them for about three weeks or so until they hatch into miniature versions of the adults. And this is a frond of java moss. That's a newly hatched shrimp to give you an idea of scale. And that's why I use a lot of sponge filtration or the corner filtration because, I mean, it, it, I'll be totally honest, like shrimp live quite well in your filter, but <laughs> they're not nearly as pretty when you don't get to see them. So it's, it's nice to, you know, sort of keep them in your display. You know, unless you want them to clean your filter media. I mean, I'm sure they do a great job of that, too. These are some of the Neocaridina varieties. Um, it seems like every few months there's, there's a new color coming out. I tend to, um, if, if you're really interested in a color form, I tend to pe tell people to wait a little bit and let it stabilize before you pay a lot of money for it because most of these um, <clears throat> did not start out particularly stable in color. Like I'm working with greens right now, which I absolutely love, but they range from like a light lemony lime green all the way to almost a turquoise color. So depending on what I want to isolate and I have multiple tanks of them, you know, I'll line breed those to get the stability. But they're, they're gorgeous and it's not that hard to, to call them. And then you know, we spent probably about, I say we, meaning everyone in the hobby, all the breeders, spent about seven years working our butts off to get this, like, great opacity, this fantastic coverage, solid legs, solid antenna, solid carapace, and then we bred clear spots in them. <laughs> so, just goes to show you, like, it's like a fashion thing, you know. Um, this, this was all the rage for a while. Now that seems to have evened out and... You know, people like both, but all these are, are ones that we sort of took a step back in our line breeding and, and encouraged the um, transparency. And again, for pretty much, I don't think there's green lilies yet, at least not in this country, but for pretty much every color form available of Neocaridina, there's the really counterpart. Um, the Asian Caridina are, are what tend to be the most popular with planted folks. Um, or... Maybe that's not fair. Maybe it's just that they tend to thrive better in the planted tanks that generally have softer water. Um, any of these are great. They, uh, yes. Are they that sensitive to temperature? Do they really like it yes. cooler? Yes. They will live. You can get them to live in, in mid-70s or it's warmer. It's not that. It's, um, I had a friend who was looking at them and decided not to because he was concerned that in the summer months, in August, there are going to be days that that tank is going to get up near 80 and if it's, as opposed to and 72, if it's, but it's going to be... You know, if it's days, not weeks or months, that's probably manageable. Um, if it's consistent, you know, that the... Everything gets accelerated. Their lifespan gets shortened. Um, they tend to lose their, their berry, lose their eggs, or the eggs don't hatch, or the babies die. 
Now, if you're going to have them in a slightly warmer tank, I keep them in like mid 60s. But if you're going to have them in a tank that's that's over 70, if you crank the oxygenation, like a lot of bubble output, it seems to help. And that makes sense because a lot of these guys come from sort of like mountain streams where they're shallow, they're cool, and there's a huge turnover rate. So you've got a high oxygen content. So I would think that, you know, as your temperatures get warmer, if you increase that oxygen content, you'd have more luck. I mean, I tried for, for years trying to keep them in my, my sort of quasi-tropical tanks, and the, the adults would live, but nothing ever happened, you know, as far as reproduction. And they're not cheap, you know, so it's, it's nicer to have them thrive. Aqua soil is great for all these guys, you know, it's a really great way to sort of produce the neutral environment that they like. And this is just what shrimps do, and this is why everybody loves them. They just do that. Look at that shrimp. <laughs> uh, if they're doing this, they, they probably don't need you to supplement their food. If they're happily picking along. You see them all swimming all over, actively seeking something to sit on and pick at. That probably means they're hungry. The biggest mistake people make with, with dwarf shrimp is, I think, overfeeding them. I rarely uh, feed my shrimp tanks because they're all planted. I'll drop, like, a, like I said, like a pellet in there every so often to sort of get an inventory and evaluate the stock and to pick out my calls and things like that. But otherwise, if they're doing this, then they don't, they don't really need anything. They're happy. Uh, these are, I really, really love. And about, it's 2003, oh gosh, it's probably been about the five or six years ago. I used to be able to get them in all the time and of really good quality. But I don't know what's going on in, uh, in Malaysia. And they actually come out of Singapore a lot. But if you, if you try and get these now, if you're like me, they, they come in and they're all mixed together. And you can see all the different varieties. Right now, all of these species are lumped into the same classification, which is Caradina bobalti. But like this, this shrimp, you know, it's inch and a quarter. This shrimp is inch and a quarter. This shrimp and these, you know, have the same sort of breeding strategy as a cherry shrimp or a crystal shrimp. But I don't know if you guys can see or not, this one has a modified larval stage which only lasts like a day or two. So they'll have thousands of these teeny tiny eggs that they release into freshwater that then convert. Clearly they're not the same species. And then you go here and this is a half inch shrimp to three quarter inch shrimp, which is sold as the same shrimp as this shrimp. And maybe that's a female and maybe that's a male or maybe they're two different species. But when they come in all mixed bag, it's a, uh, it's kind of a nightmare, and, and they, they, the exporters do a really terrible job of packaging them. And one of the reasons um, they have the, the name that they do, especially this one, this one is the one that will retain that Babalti uh, label probably, is this large serrated rostrum or nose. See, it looks it's very stylish. <laughs> so. But these are actually my favorite. These are Indian White Banded. And what's nice about these is they won't hybridize with your crystals or your bees or any of, or your tigers. They won't hybridize with your Neocaridina. They like about the same water chemistry as all your cherries, all those Neos. So you, you can have several species together for different color without risk of hybridization and undoing the line breeding that's in a lot of the other, other shrimp. Because this is just how they show up in the wild. Uh, these guys are really cool. You'll see them to a purple color all the way down to like a light tan with this, this banding. They're, they're really my favorite. I do have some that I was able to get in at home, but I'm hoarding them. <laughs> so you'll have to wait for offspring. A mono shrimp, I'm sure all of you have probably kept a mono shrimp at one time or another. They're fantastic. I like to show this ancient slide of mine um, that I had this chunk of wood with BBA. I was like, oh no, BBA. I added 200 or so Amanos. <laughs> hey, I got them, why not, right? And, and this was like three days later. Wow, so, you know, your mileage is gonna vary. You know, what I tell people, if, if you're running a lot of tanks and you have some of these slow growing plants, you know, especially Anubias tend to get that around the edges of the older leaves. If you can set up a little five or 10 gallon just for Amanos and you can pull those rhizome plants and put it in their tank and not feed them anything else, you're, this will be exactly what happens for you. Exactly. If you add Amanos to a big lush planted tank with fish that you're feeding, the Amanos are gonna eat what tastes good. 
they're not gonna they're not gonna go after this algae which would be like eating you know raw ziti noodles they're gonna they're gonna eat you know what's delicious but if you don't provide them with the things that are delicious, they absolutely tear this up. Mm. Uh, and this is like that really fine filamentous, hairy algae stuff. I can't remember what it's called, but it's, it's terrible. It's not the kind that you can take out with a toothbrush. It's the kind that's just like the bane of my existence. But Amano's like it, which is helpful. And this, I again, what I do is I grab affected plants and I just plunk them into the Amano tank. They have a... A 75, I have a 75 gallon of just Amanos, and, and this is their job. Can and I'll just leave, Amanos? pardon? Can you breed Amanos? I, I mean, I'm sure I could, but they require salinity. Yeah, and I, I don't do salt. <laughs> I don't even hatch brine shrimp, because I don't like it. I, that's, I no better explanation. Uh, we try. You would be producing your own Amanos. Yeah, but they're cheap. And I wouldn't have to have, I mean, the thing with the monos is as they're going through their different larval stages, they need different salinity and different food. So I'd have to set up a rack of tanks. I, I sell yeah. two or 300 monos a week. You know, I would have to have pretty much a warehouse operation just for monos. Pardon? You got any extra on you? I have them at the house. At the house. <laughs> you know. Like, I, need, I need to get more monos now. You know, but, you know, and what I will do is I, I often have customers that say, I really want to breed these. So the ones that are in, I have maybe four display tanks at my house out of all of the tanks. They all have monos in them. So I'll pull the big buried females from there and I'll send them to them for shipping if they really want to work with trying to breed a mono shrimp. I would love to have a domestic source. I would love to pay someone to be my do domestic source. I have no desire to be the domestic source. You know, it, it, it would be a full-time job because uh, you have to move them and watch. I mean, they swim at different angles during different larval stages, and that's how you know to change. Right. That sounds like uh, even more work than what I'm doing. Snails, uh, I love them. No, I'm going to just stop you right here. Sure. No, you haven't, I, I haven't seen the, the, the ones that Khan gave me a couple of years ago. Whatever they were. Oh, oh, they're uh, the red claws. Red claws. Um, red claws. Trim. Trim. Yeah, oh, I don't deal with macrobrachium generally. Um, they're they're nice. They're just a little bit sassier. They're um, more of a scavenger than an omnivore and a picker. So they tend to be a little bit more aggressive to each other after molting and to other species. So as I mean, I've kept them. I've bred them, you know, I, I think I even wrote an article on them, but they're not one that I generally keep in my fish room. Not because they're not my shrimp, but they're just not my particular interest. Where, where do you find them now? Oh. Uh, they come in as contaminants a lot, and there's, there's, there's vendors online, I'm sure, that sell them. I don't know anyone offhand anymore that I would recommend. Yeah. I could find out for you, though. Yeah. You know, shoot me a message. So snails are what started me in this hobby. Um, specifically, mystery snails, apple snails, or that species of apple snail. And I, you know, think they've often had a bad rap over the years, but they can be really, really useful. One snail that I love, but that I avoid are the, the rabbit snails um, from Sulawesi, mainly because I've imported them, I don't know how many times, bajillions, and they always come in with these uh, snail specific leeches, and I don't, I don't do leeches. And it's very difficult to treat snail whose entire body is mucosa with any medications that will kill a leech without killing the snail. So what you end up having to do is do a super, super strong saline concentration, dip, dip the snails in that until they produce so much slime in response to their massive discomfort that all the little uh, leeches are ejected and you pick them out manually with tweezers. Yeah. That is not Maybe a good use do. of my time. <laughs> that is not a good use of my time. So I've just stopped dealing with them altogether, despite them being really neat. Um, they're, they're neat for a lot of reasons. They're neat because, you know, they move like lurch, and they get, some of them get this big. There's some that are smaller. They have a social behavior where they'll bump heads to greet each other, you know. <laughs> they're, they're really cool, except for the leeches. You know, and they give birth, there seems to be two strategies. One is like a, a live bearer, the other this like mento looking thing. 
egg sac comes out, which dissolves upon hitting the water. You know, so they, they give birth to a singular young at a time. I dissected a few, and the most of those eggs I ever found inside were four, I think. So I would think that that would mean that these guys can store sperm like, like apple snails um, for several months. Assassin snails are extremely popular. I actually really don't like them for planted tanks, um, despite not wanting necessarily to have pest snails in my planted tanks, and that's mainly because they lay their eggs, which are these little tiny, they, they look sort of like pup tents, little triangle tents, but they're about the size of a sesame seed, so really tiny. Right at the base of all your plants or inside the pores of your driftwood or rock, um, or inside the pores of your filter media. All these white things are assassin snail eggs. Oh. Which, you know, is not a big deal if, if you know, that they, they'll definitely take care of your pest snails. The problem that I have is I go to a lot of clubs and a lot of auctions and I have an impulse control problem. So I buy a lot of plants and then I bring home these plants and I put them in my my snail tanks where I'm intentionally raising snails and then assassin snails hatch out and eat all my profits. So to me, I, I like to say it's like assassin snail, a cautionary tale. Yeah, I think the best thing that you can do if, if you're gonna be raising assassin snails and you're gonna be selling, sharing, or whatever plants, just label it so people know. Because if I know, then I'll put them in an assassin tank or I'll put them in a bucket for a month or two or whatever to make sure that I don't add assassins where I don't want them. I used to have assassins in two tanks. Now they're in about 80. So, just, which is all right. Everybody eats assassin snails. <laughs> My hammer. <laughs> <laughs> loaches. <laughs> but loaches also eat, you know, other snails or shrimp or a lot of times well, small cleaned fish. up your other I've never problems. had a problem with, <laughs> with pest snails. It actually took me almost three years to get the Malaysian trumpets really going in my fish room because I don't use substrate and I do multiple large water changes a week on every tank. And I don't, I don't, I only feed half the week. I mean, I feed half the week. So, you know, and I have algae eaters. So I don't have algae, I don't have leftover food, I don't have dirty substrate. My lights are on a seven hour timer. You know, there's nothing, nothing to feed pest snails. So I actually, the only place I really have them is in my pleco breeding tanks where there's lots of fries. So I throw in like, you know, enough pellets to feed one of my big gar to, you know, two inch fish. So, but I raise them because other people want them and they're not hard. Um, this is what they do. They have this, this long pr proboscis. Do I have a video next? No. They have this long proboscis and they'll cruise around the tank without out, that out, sort of sniffing out their prey. And then they have this forked appendage that they then ram into the body of the snail. Uh, it's not entirely clear whether they inject um, sort of a venom or a paralytic, but then they sort of suck the body out. And I, I edited the photo so you couldn't see it, but this is actually a, a pest snail blood trail. It was very gory. I was very excited. I have a whole sequence of photos of that. <laughs> but, you know, I try and be sensitive to those of a more delicate nature. So I toned it down a little bit. After a video. Yeah. <laughs> they, they will even, the, the assassin snails are only, you know, an inch or so. They'll even eat these larger snails. And what they'll do is three or four of them will gang up on them. All of them will go after them and then they'll eat it. So a big snail isn't safe from a little, the little assassins. Um, nearite snails, depending on species, have a little bit better survival with them, mainly because the, the opening going into their body is a very tight angle, and the assassins have a difficult time getting that sort of forked you know, weapon physically into their body. I like to keep mystery snails around for a lot of reasons. One, they're, they're cute. They've got a lot of cool little snail antics. Um, but more importantly is I like to breed fish. And snails have, this type of snail has a very inefficient digestive tract. So if you feed them a good quality diet, half of it comes out in their poop, but partially digested, which then gets stuck in their slime, which makes excellent fry food. And it also produces infusoria, another excellent fry food. So if you're working with something like, um, say like Aspidorus, the little tiny, little tiny quarry type cats, 
I throw apple snails in with them um, so that I feed the fry, I feed the snails. As the snails digest the food and poop all over the tank, the fry don't have to travel far to find a source of nutrition. These guys actually, when they were first introduced or studied, they used to call them infusoria snails for that reason. It's kind of neat. There's some nice, really old articles from the 60s and 70s about infusoria snails if you're a geek like me. Sexing them, boys have a penis, girls don't, but they're pretty shy about showing it. Um, they also have this breathing siphon, which is not a penis. This is what they look like when they mate. The females, do I have a picture? No. Um, the females then lay this egg clutch above the water line. If you're gonna be working with mystery snails, you need to at least drop the water level down to the bottom of the trim, so there's a couple inches. If not, they will try and find a way out of your tank in order to lay their egg clutch. I tend to pull them off and make this extremely expensive and complicated um, incubator, which is a lunch meat container with a, a damp paper towel and then some dry ones. I float it in the tank that I'm going to raise them in, and after about eight days, it gets this moldy appearance, which is the baby snails eating their way out. At that point, I drop them into a little uh, floating fry box mainly because this is the size they are on my finger and that's a couple you know several days to a week old it's very difficult to maintain a substrate or clean a tank when there's um, 200 of those all over it so i leave them in, in one of these that way i can see what colors i'm getting because if i'm trying to do uh, a lime breeding thing where i want purples and pinks and greens but not not golds, then I'll just, you know, crush all the golds and keep the ones I want. And they get about pea size, then I release them into the tank. And the reason I float them and raise them in the tank that I'm going to keep them in is that every time you change an apple snail's tank, if there's a discrepancy between temperature or parameter, they get a growth ring. So it just makes their snails not quite as pretty. Their shells, rather. Micro crabs, just a little creepy dude that I think are cool. Um, they don't, this, this is all they do. They don't be... No wows, no woos, you know, this, this is what they do. At least until you feed them, and when you feed them, they all tilt up on their side, extend these long legs with these, these pylos hairs on there, and uh, collect the food that they then groom off themselves, which is kind of neat. They've got these big furry claws, so they take those and they clean their legs, and that's how they eat. And this is one carrying babies, all the little babies. It used to be thought for the longest time that, um, they released their eggs as larvae into the water column and then they would develop, but I discovered that uh, they actually hold them until they become little crabs and that's why the, the yield for so many people was negligent or negligible. Um, I, I haven't quite figured out what my magic trick for doing this was. As far as I know, I'm the only one that has. I'm not quite sure why it works for me, but I get results, so that's nice. But they're neat little, little creepy critters. Crayfish I can't carry anymore. He has some of these uh, Camborellis over in his 29. I love them. I love them to death. They breed very similarly to shrimp. They're very sassy little suckers. You can see here's a mama holding a bunch of babies. You know. They're, Pennsylvania doesn't let you have them? No, they're illegal as of January of last year. Because of, it's, it's, a, it's a bait crayfish issue, but instead of them banning specific species or practices, they banned crayfish across the boards. Which was a shame because I had just isolated out like this really awesome blue, like the bottom of the blue in your banner, dwarf crayfish. I was super stoked. It took me like two years. I was like, yeah! <laughs> and I fed them to my fish, you know? Like, I can't keep, keep them. Well, I mean, I'm sure I could, but I get visits from fish and game. So I don't really want to have anything that I shouldn't be selling. Um, because I, it's hard to say no when someone comes in, especially if they live in Jersey and they're allowed to have them. You know, it's hard to say no, but I, I can't sell them. And they're reproducing like, what it, you know, I just, whatever. It was a sad day in Rachel land. But sexing them is pretty easy. The boys have this extra set of uh, sort of hockey stick-shaped legs behind their walking legs. This guy's missing a walking leg. I guess his lady got a little amorous. He'll take sperm packets, attach them underneath her uh, belly here, 
Right, and she will then take them and fertilize herself through this little hole, her ovipositor. It's a little circle. So if you're looking at the crayfish, the boys have this extra set and the girls has a little circle right there. This is an adult size in my hand and that's them holding their babies. I was writing an article for Amazonas Magazine on them. So I had uh, this female in a two gallon tank because I wanted to um, capture the photograph of her releasing the first baby. You know, I, I thought it'd be really neat. You know, well, thoughts are wonderful, but she, she held on to them for weeks. They would, they would release and go out on the plants and she would swim over them and scoop them back up so that I couldn't get, I, I felt like it was so that I couldn't get my picture. <laughs> Perhaps it was the giant looming black lens that was more intimidating. So I finally gave up because my deadline was passed and I threw her back in the tank and within seconds of going back into the normal tank there and she let them all go. She was the one I was happy to feed my fish. But, so anyway, they're neat, and as I said, now there's there's several different species. This is uh, Camborellus catsburensis. There's four or five different dwarf species that you can find, but not the blue ones that I was working with. So fishes, you know, inverts are, are what I started with, but fish have really become more of my passion as I've, I've grown into this hobby, and it's mainly because so many more new and exciting teeny tiny fish are becoming available on the market. Barraras are probably the smallest and in my opinion the most outgoing. These are the most popular, your chilies. Um, teeny tiny little guys. I'm going to try and not go too slow here. I know I'm taking up a lot of your time. These are tiger shrimp and this is a little herbrosis quarry and in a minute you'll see a, a Barraras come in to, to view. And the reason I have this video is I love, love the internet. You know, it's been an amazing thing, but I read all the time about Barraris, people saying Barraris are going to eat their adult shrimp. And I look at this little fish and I look at these shrimp and I wonder, I mean, how, who comes up with this stuff? I mean, have these people never even seen these guys? It doesn't happen. They're, they're very suitable together. Now, that being said, any fish will try and eat, any fish that isn't an algae grazer will try and eat baby shrimp if they can. So you're going to, if you want to breed shrimp, obviously no predators at all is your best route. But the, I think that those guys are the best, well, some of the best. I don't have some of the other ones I really like in this presentation for, for keeping with shrimp. These are just some of the more popular ones, some I like more than others. Um, I sell these guys all day long, every week, and they're my least favorite nano fish. I still like them or I wouldn't carry them, but they're, they're just a bit shy and um, they actually have a surprisingly high prey drive for their size, both for invertebrates and their own eggs and fry, so they make me mad. I do, however, breed them outside every summer and like I moved out um, seven of these and brought in 200 or 300 offspring this wow. fall. So. Definitely very doable. Espies are one of my favorite. That's not a particularly good video, but I like how it shows uh, sort of how they group. Brevibora dorsia salata, or the emerald eye resbora, is probably my favorite of the schooling fish for their schooling behavior. It's extremely in the top third. If you think about one of the planet tanks that has the grass on the sides and you know, and your carpet and some nice rocks and you want them to hang out in the middle right here, that's your fish. It's small, and it's gonna, they, man, all in one direction, turn on a dime, all in the other direction, turn on a dime, all in one direction. It's what they do nonstop. Kuba ties are really nice. They're a little more outgoing. This one's less common, less flashy, but I prefer it. Um, I actually don't really like this fish either, but it's very pretty. The boys are very pretty, nice and blue. There's also green and red forms. And uh, my, one of my favorites is always, always white clouds which he has some of those, as well as the SBs and these guys over there. Uh, these are some African species. Um, I'm supposed to be getting some of these next week. They are under a half an inch, super rare, pretty costly, but they get my fish keeping rocks off in a major way. <laughs> really, really sassy little guys. If I did a really blown up photography, they have lots of little teeth, but they're too small to really do any damage to anything. Really cool little barb. Uh, this is an African tetra. 
Uh, these are drape fin barbs, which the, the females get a pretty decent size, but they're really cool because the, the, um, they have a really, one, I forget if it's a male or a female right now, I don't know why my brain is farting, but they get a really huge fin, and then the other one has a short yellow fin. Barbus J I carry a lot. You'll see them in stores from time to time, uh, J barbs, but they're, they're, they're always sort of clear looking. But you get them home and you put them in a planted tank and you can see them, like if they were in a, in a four gallon tank, I could see them from across the room. The red gets so nice. These are some of the more South American species. I threw in a token live bear. I don't, I don't work with live bears, so I threw in a token live bear. That's nano for you guys. Mm -hmm. uh, some pencils. These three are pencils, a little killifish. Uh, ember tetras are really popular. Ruby tetras are one of my favorite. Again, they're another fish that really look like garbage when you see them in a store or if you get them shipped in generally. I mean, they look clear with a black dot. Like, who wants that? But if you feed them well and you settle them in, that red is, you guys have a bunch of them, don't you? Or did? No, we no? don't have ruby tetras. We've got the or was it you? Do you have them, Tom? Yeah, it's like you. Yeah. Aren't they? Yeah. They're like, whoo, show stealers. Show stealers. I wish that um, I wish that they settled in quicker so that we could use them for like aquascaping displays and stuff at, at conventions because they're a fish that I really they, they're inexpensive, but they're gorgeous. Rainbows. Everybody likes rainbows. I like rainbows. Rainbows are easy to breed with mop spawns. There's a whole bunch of them out there. Um, they stay small. I a couple people got these that I brought today. They spawn every morning, almost continuously. <laughs> so, really? yeah, they, they like morning. Well, there's big jumpers there, right? Yeah, I mean, I use all open top tanks and I haven't found any on the floor. Yeah, yeah. Um, but they're, they're definitely top water, so they're more prone to jumping than something that's more mid water. You know, there's a lot of activity in my fish room all the time, so nothing, you know, the only thing I have lids on are, are my gars. Captain Cranky Pants because he bites. <laughs> um, and my um, Wabuka Dottie Bergeri, which are a little orange hatchet fish out of India. And because those suckers, I found them in probably 25 tanks all over the fish room. I have no idea how they manage that jump. <laughs> I mean, it, I've never seen anything like that. Never seen a fish jump like those guys. You know, and killies are prone to jumping. Not the clowns so much, but most of the other species. So these, I mean, yeah, I mean, they've got that sort of pectoral alignment that keeps them up at the top. So I would say, yeah, they, they would definitely be more prone than a lot, but I don't find them to be particularly startly or jumpy fish as far as top dwelling fish go. It's probably more of an answer than what you wanted. <laughs> but now you got it. <laughs> centerpiece fish, a lot of people like to use centerpiece fish. I keep species tanks. But I did get really jazzed when I saw a honey gourami over there because they're one of my favorites. You know, simple. I like a lot of the wild fetas. Um, I've worked with a lot of apistos and, and crebensis over the years. And, you know, they can really, really kick up sort of the wow factor. But in a really tiny tank, what I prefer is these little dudes, these little Dario species. Excuse this me. Is, Qu yes. Question on the bettas? Yes. You know, I've got like six or eight female bettas in the big mm -hmm. tank. And they're doing just fine. You yep. Know? And I'll put a male in there, and he doesn't seem to last that long. I don't quite understand why. He should be happy as a clam, I would think. I, I don't think he would like, your angels would like him very much. They never you, seem to have, you, like, you know, torn fins or anything. I don't know. I've had experiences where females are heralds. And they have the dominance with the, the alpha they, they, female. They, they and then they will they're all attack the male. I don't know. I, I honestly, the only domestic betta I've ever kept is my 11 year old daughters. I, I, I don't keep them. Not that I don't like them. I went to the International Betta Congress show in Ontario because I like to look at them, but I've, I've, I've never kept them. So I can't really. Uh, I find that uh, I can't keep a, that I can keep a harem fine and the males cannot go in with them no. because they will just tear each other up. The girls mm. will tolerate other girls. But the male will not tolerate the females, and the females will not tolerate the male. Hmm. And I guess that's why most of the time so with those, they put them together experience. to breed and they separate them. The thing is, the male never looks like the dragon, though. Maybe they're relentless for his maybe attention. Just, <laughs> maybe he's just. And his heart breaks maybe in half because he can't shoot. Maybe he's taking that shoot. long to kill him. <laughs> <laughs> 
I like these guys. Maybe I don't have to beat them up for a week. I like the mouth brooders. I think it's really cool to see a smaller fish walk or, you know, swim around with a mouth full of babies. I think that's cool. So I tend to gravitate towards those. There's some that are even smaller that are cochina, little scarlet wild bettas that are really awesome for small tanks. And licorice garami, but I don't, um, I keep playing with this mic. It's gonna, you're gonna love me when editing. Um, I don't, I don't sell a lot of licorice garamis because the vast majority, well, of most of the species I carry, but especially with licorice garami, their, their habitats are being destroyed at an alarming rate, and many species have already possibly been wiped out. So unless someone's really prepared to breed them, I won't sell them to them. But there is a uh, a group of individuals and a website called the Paris Rominas Project that you can find online that has a database of everybody who's registered with them as far as keeping and breeding. So if you're interested in getting them, I really recommend that you support those efforts and get your fry through someone who's who's actively breeding them rather than having collectors stomping through their threatened habitat collecting these little tiny fish and destroying the, the peat areas. So that's what, yes. What was that website again? Paris Rominus Project. Thank you. It's international, so you may have to use the translate button, but they send out a newsletter and they have a few books they put out as well with different species, husbandry, feeding, breeding, caring, all that. It's, it's pretty neat. I don't send that one to the spam filter. So <laughs> anyway, Dario's are neat. They're tiny, under an inch, very sassy. They think they're cichlids. No one told them. Can be a little bit more challenging uh, to keep just because they prefer live foods most often. You can eventually get them onto frozen and sometimes dried, but the vast majority of them really thrive best with uh, live food. But they're gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous little teeny guys. Some bottom dwellers, this uh, African, sort of the equivalent of an African otocinclus. These are achysis, they sting, don't handle them. You've been stung, haven't you? Yeah. Yeah. I, I have it. I have it. Hurt. It hurt. And it was its own fault because it was, it was hunting, so it was up in the greenery that was floating at the top of the tank, which normally they bury themselves in the sand. Um, but yeah, it was up in the top and I was pulling out greenery because it was floating and taking over the tank and <clears throat> grabbed a handful and it bit. Did, uh, <laughs> did you get a reaction? My, my thumb hurt really bad. It never, there was no swelling. There was never any sort of discoloration or anything like that. It hurt. I treated it like- Because I know they do a, have venom, so. They do have, a, they have venom and I, I treated it just like a, a, like a, like a lionfish stings you. You're supposed right. to run it under as hot a water as you can. And man, I could tell you, under hot water, it didn't hurt. And then I would take it out, and it hurt again. Anyway, so if you're ever working week. with a, a chysis, you know, be careful. Yeah. They're, yeah. they're like a bumblebee type cat, so gotta be. And these are little anchor cats that I love. Uh, some of my favorites are not coolies so much. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. Everyone laughs at me, they scare me. I don't know why. Give me the heebie-jeebies and like my arm hairs stand up and I don't know. It used to be if I was going to have those in the fish room, I had to put them in the tank behind my recliner so that I, if I was hanging out down there, I couldn't see them because I'd sit there and I'd just get like goosebumps. But I love these hovering loaches. Uh, these guys have been re become really hard to source, but they're really neat because they hang out in the midwater, you know, so they dance on the glass and hang out midwater. So very different from a lot of other loaches. And really nice for a planted tank because they don't disrupt your substrate, you know. And they're also um, snail safe if you're concerned about that. Rhinoglobias, these are some of the hill strings. This is what I'm going to be working with in my 150, just a few of the species. Again, this is a, an inch fish, inch and a quarter, maybe inch and a half. Uh, these are breedable, these are not. Just really, really cool hill stream species, meaning lots and lots of oxygen. They don't need the current as much as they need the oxygen. I'm going to do the current because they all have these modified uh, fins to couple into rocks and glass, and I want to be able to videotape, photograph, and write about those sorts of behaviors. For instance, these guys um, live in, in above uh, waterfalls, and they lay their eggs in these big nests, and all the eggs are swept out the whole way down to sea, down waterfalls, through narrow streams, the whole way out to sea and then they migrate back 
after converting up waterfalls over rocks through these little streams and up more waterfalls to the, the pools where they're collected. It's really fascinating. Uh, nobody's bred them yet, but I really want to document the, uh, the behaviors and I just think they're so neat. Uh, and that what's neat about them as well is they can change colors sort of like you think of a, a chameleon. They'll, they'll be gray with an orange dorsal if they're being picked on. If they're the dominant, they'll turn half black, half blue. They'll turn yellow. They'll turn orange. All like this. It's really incredible. Fascinating fish. Um, so this is uh, Percnopteri genus. That's the dominant male. You can see he's got the, the dark dorsal, the blue, and the gold. This is an Atropurius. This is, see, well... He didn't he was a trouble maker. But you saw how that other one had the gray body and the orange fin, see, right here? That's less, that's subdominant coloration. Um, the females are all gray with stripes. There's another subdom. He's, he's probably the lowest man on the totem pole, only his cheeks were colored up. Just really fascinating. You see that guy? You can see his, his dorsal's turning orange because he's being threatened. So he's losing some of that most dominant, bold coloration, and it's, it's transferring. There's that Siamese algae eater again. But I just find these guys really fascinating and, that, and that's what my next book is hopefully gonna be on is sort of uh, maintaining, feeding, building the setup to appropriately house all these little dwarf hill stream species. Because I just think they're the bee's knees. There's an achysis. And this is a rhinogobius uh, duospilus. You can see the color difference, same species. Yeah. Anyway, they're cool stuff, very cool stuff. Again, now they would not be appropriate for your high-tech plant tank at all. However, they do do very well with some plants, like I'm gonna be planting with Anubiuses, Bulbitis, maybe some Val, some Bucephalandras, uh, things like that, that'll, mainly rhizome type plants that I can glue into the crevices of my wood and, and rocks that I'm putting in there. Um, the bulbitis especially really appreciates the sort of hill stream flow. These are some of the little South American catfish, Hebrosis, Pygmaeus. These are some of my favorites. Those two, very hard to get. You know, that's under a half an inch. This is an inch. Spilotus are a little bit larger. Some of the ototypes. I like to give lecture on odos because I feel like they're, they're, um, they're really mistreated in the hobby. They are absolutely inappropriate for a small tank. Uh, not because they don't live, but because they are social. And if you have enough of them, they school like Tetras, literally school like Tetras. If I keep them in a 75 or a 55, I have a tank with uh, probably 100 Odos and maybe 100 Green Neons. They all school together in the midwater. I mean, they are not a fish that likes to be alone. And part of the reason that they have such a fragile reputation is that they're kept in ones or twos in little tanks. You know, they just, they really don't thrive. Catfish are very long lived. They should not be a species that, you know, dies out on you. If they are, it's because you don't have enough space for them to eat properly, or you don't have enough of them for them to be socially comfortable and relax. Just a, as an aside, so this is Kokama. They're a little less picky about having as many friends as the smaller, you know, normal Otocinclus. It's an Ancestress. You know, all of these guys are great. These guys are slightly easier to feed because their their actual teeth are larger than the smaller Otocinclus. So they're nice, but they're also you know twenty times the cost. So is what it is. But they're gorgeous. This is a uh, green. Parotosynclus out of Uruguay, so that's a cool water species if you are running a cool water tank, especially if you're into sort of native plants or something, this would be an excellent choice. Uh, this is a cool water bumblebee cat. And then I have sort of this uh, love affair with little wood cats. You'd never see them um, except for at feeding time and when, when you feed them, they come out and they, like I would sit my hand in the tank and they would just come and sit in my fingers and eat the food out of my hand. Just this neat, crazy little behavior. But what's interesting about them is, uh, I, I like to say that they're good for the fish keeping family or couple. Because if you have, you know, say a wife that's into live bears and a husband that's into egg scatterers, these are the perfect union because the males have an elongated anal fin that they use for internal fertilization. 
So they mate like a live bear, but then she lays eggs. So it's kind of cool, you know, you can bring the whole fish keeping family together. <laughs> it's another species that's more readily available. One thing I like to mention about these is you can see how serrated their pectoral spines are. You, you can't net these guys very safely. They get stuck and it's easy as anything to just rip the entire spine out of their chest. They don't do very well without it. So. How big do they get? It uh, depends on the species. There's species that these uh, Centromoclus reticulatus, the purple guys, get our inch and a half. Perugiae or the honeycomb catfish, slightly larger. And there's species that, you know, go up to this size that you can get of yeah, Centromoclus. I, I don't right now, but uh, Peru season start. Peru and Brazil, best collecting season starts like November. Generally, generally, when it's worst, the worst for me to get fish in is the best to get them from, you know, South America, unfortunately. Uh, but it's their dry season. Rain, rainy season is when it's nice here. Dry season is when it's not so nice here. So that's when you can get the littler fish that I think are cool. Why are they called oil catfish? I have no idea. Wood cats make more sense because they hide in the crevice of wood. But I don't know why they're called oil Oil spots? <laughs> Maybe. I, I mean, we could make up anything we want, and no one could ever tell us we're wrong. <laughs> Take a check. Yeah, keep those in school also? You don't have to, but man, you've never seen anything like a ton of these coming out from all the crevices to swarm the water column to eat. It's really cool. They're, they're not particularly necessarily social, um, per se. I just think it's really neat. I had, I think, 300 of the purple guys. It was so neat, man. I got nothing done when I had those fish. I would just sit there. They, they ate better than anything else that's ever been in my fish room, too. It was terrible. Well, they were happy. Um, what's neat, too, with, with these guys, is, uh, or with any of the wood cats, um, is that the eggs are really large. They look sort of like, almost like frog eggs, like these big gelatinous puddles of eggs. And you can see the fry development inside them. And that's, that's kind of exciting if you're into breeding fish. How do you catch them if you say you shouldn't use a net? I herd them and I, ha I hand catch a lot of fish. Um, huh. I'm pretty fast. But usually what I'll do is I'll, I use large like um, rubber nets, you know, or large like koi net type things where it holds a lot of water and you have them swimming around in there and then I pick them out. I lift it up to the surface and I pick them out and move them to a plastic container. Huh. I just, I don't want, I don't want to damage them. Same thing with, with, um, the little uh, hara cats, I hand catch those too. The, the rigid pectoral spines that are in sort of that bowed appearance are very, just so easy to get stuck in a net and ripped out or broken and then that makes them prone to infection. So. And then just to go over a few things in case you haven't heard my voice enough, overfeeding as I mentioned I think is you know sort of the biggest problem with a lot of these little fish. You have to remember that most of them pick at a little tiny a bit of food constantly. You know, they're, they're not ones, they're not like a piscivore or a larger fish that, you know, sees its prey, eats it, and then doesn't eat for a while. These guys are picking at whatever little micro crustaceans are floating around in the water column at all times. Little and often, you know, small amount of food, just a little sprinkle at a time, you know, when you walk by the tank is much better than doing more of a significant feeding. It, that also helps you, you know, not get planaria from the food going into your substrate. It makes your maintenance easy. It keeps your tank more stable, you know, whatever. Um, fertilizers, I, I didn't really talk about this because I don't use them, but with, with shrimp in particular, you have to really pay attention to what you're dosing. Now, at this point in the hobby, you know, there's so many things that are available. It's not as bad as it was, you know, 10, 10 years ago or more when the only fertilizers that were really being offered were only focused on plants and not anything else living. You know, you want to avoid copper. I like to tell people to, to not overdo it with the nitrates um, right before you're going to add invertebrates. Tom Barr and I argue about this all the time. He's like, I dose my nitrates to nine billion. <laughs> <laughs> like, never die. I, I never saw him say that. <laughs> they 
never die. That's a myth. But, I mean, I think what probably happens is, you know, Tom's shrimp are breeding in his tank. They're acclimated to that water. You know, he's Tom Barr. He gives him a dirty look and threatens him with some driftwood. I don't know. But in my experience of, you know, 12 years of breeding shrimp, if you are going to add new shrimp, clean water, meaning less nutrient in the water column, is easiest for their acclimation. So usually I tell people, you know, cut back on dosing your nitrate, do a water change, add your shrimp, and then gradually ramp it back up. And they will do better than if you, especially if you use dry ferts where you're, you're dosing, you know, a lot. It can be kind of rough on them. Um, Run over all of this. Oh, and adding to one thing I like to add as well with, with shrimp specifically or small tanks specifically, one of the tricks that I really like to do when I'm adding new critters to a small tank is, is I use poly filter for the first few days to a week. Poly filter is a, a filter media. You buy it in sheets. It is not polyfill, it is not filter floss. It is a chemical media. It's white and it changes color to show you what it's filtering out. One of the problems with little sensitive critters and little tanks is that your fluctuation can happen so fast you may not see it in time to do anything about it. Polyfilter does not have to be inside your filter. I cut like a postage stamp size, drop it in any tank that I'm adding new critters to, and I watch the polyfilter. If it starts to turn yellow, I do a water change. You know, if it's turning brown, that's organics. If it's turning blue, that's metals. And it can really help you sort of trub, you know, troubleshoot and problem solve why you sometimes have issues specifically with invertebrates, <coughs> but it really can make life easier for a small tank in general um, to, to use that to sort of stabilize things for you. Um, and I think that's it. Does anybody have any other questions? Talked enough for you?